Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight for our June first Tuesdays with Heart. Heart stands for Healing, Empowering, and Rebuilding Together. We're a peer support program for anyone impacted by any mass violence incident. Real quick, wanted to introduce you to the Heart team. Alice is the co-director of Heart. She's a Route 91 and UNLV support group facilitator as well. Aki, whose internet is being wonky, so she probably won't be on, um, is a heart coach. She's one of our original coaches. She's also the Resiliency and Justice Center Behavioral Health Program Coordinator. And I'm the co-director of Heart, along with Route. I'm a survivor of Route 91, and I assist Alice with the UNLV support group. So we like to start each one of these programs um, with a picture that just kind of a lot of us can can resonate with. And if not now, from time to time, you know, there's so many times that people have a smile on their face. And so everybody thinks that we're OK, but we're just a, a mess inside. Um, so this one really resonated with me because I tend to smiling as my go to. And it doesn't always mean that I'm I'm OK. Um, so just wanted to go through the housekeeping information real quick. Program is intended for those directly or indirectly impacted by a mass violence incident. Um, directly is people who are physically there, first responders, et cetera. Indirectly could be our family member, friends, um, community members, anybody who was in the area at the time. So we would like to ask if anybody does not fall under this category, any of these categories, if you would please uh, remove yourself at this time. We'd like to keep this a safe, safe space for us. Um, we want to remind you to be respectful of everyone in the group. Please do not share details or uh, other um, discussions without anybody outside of tonight's attendees. But you can tell people about what you learned from Manya. Um, super excited to have her speak to us tonight. The attention of this group is to learn and discuss our healing journey and challenges we may encounter. We do not want to discuss the details of the incidents themselves because we don't want to activate others. It is absolutely okay. We're going to ask you in a minute um, to, to put in the chat which incident you were impacted by, and that's absolutely fine to do. Um, as Alice mentioned, we'll be recording the presentation portion of tonight's meeting, and that link will be available hopefully sometime next week. Um, but we do not re record the discussion because we want to make sure that you guys know that this is safe. If you know how to raise your hand under the reactions in Zoom, that would be really helpful. So um, we don't have everybody jumping in at the same time. And if you would please make sure that you're muted when you're not talking, it really helps our IT guy clean up the video um, so that we can get that posted as soon as possible. And we don't want any discussions on politics, weapons, conspiracy theories, anything like that that could potentially go south really quick. Okay, so um, wanted to introduce our, our present presenter for tonight, Manya Chilinski. She is a keynote speaker. She's an advocate. She has her own podcast, and she's also a survivor of the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, she is a communication expert with a background in writing, research, and marketing. So she has a lot of really powerful insights that she can share with us with both that background as well as, as the experiential knowledge of a survivor. Um, she has shared her wisdom on stages like South by Southwest, TEDx, CBS, NPR, and in the Boston Globe. Her honest and down-to-earth approach when addressing challenging topics resonates with a diverse audience. And her passion lies in advocating for those affected by psychological wounds, em emphasizing the importance of validation and visibility on the path to recovery and growth. Um, we actually, if you guys were here for our second first two days with heart, we had another Boston Marathon survivor, Amy O'Neill, um, speak to us. And Amy was the one who thankfully um, got us in contact with, with Manya. So we really, really appreciate that. Hi there, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. You know, when we think about anger, I think that some people think that it is destructive. But what if when we're thinking about violence, that energy, that anger actually is energy that we need to rebuild ourselves, to recover, and maybe even push for change. 
So like Jill said, I am a survivor of the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, in 2013, I got tickets for the bleacher seats, which was only the second time that ever happened. And uh, it was so cool because as you can see in this picture, that's the finish line. It's right there, the yellow line across the street. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Boston Marathon or any marathon, but you know, it's this party atmosphere. The guy in the blue tent there is announcing people as they finish and it's loud and exciting. And, you know, some people are really struggling as they get to the to the 26 mile mark, which I would have been struggling 13 or 26 miles before. Like, I can't believe people have made it this far. And so I'm all about cheering these people on, right? I'm screaming, you know, go. And if a lot of people put their name on their, you know, to put their name on their shirt and I'll be screaming their name, like, go Jill, you're almost there. You've done it. And I just loved being there. Um, and it was so exciting to be in the bleachers. And that's where I was standing at 2.49 when the bomb, the first of two bombs exploded across the street from me. And in my case, my response was to freeze. I was frozen in place. I had tunnel vision, staring at what was happening across the street from me, trying to figure out what what is this? What's happening? What am I supposed to do at this moment? And as all of that was going over in my brain, that's when the second bomb went off and it was off to my left and I turned and I saw it. And that's when I knew I still didn't know what was happening, but I knew I had to get out of there. So I said that to my friends, we evacuated the bleachers with everyone else and made our way um, around. We actually walked closer to the site. We walked closer to the finish line and made our way around to the front of the Boston Public Library. And I had been there with several friends and we got separated. So we stopped there to wait to kind of all of us come together. And that's when I realized I was sobbing. And that was as I know you all can appreciate the first of many, many tears about that day. So I wasn't physically hurt and I'm so grateful for that, but I didn't know that that meant I wasn't okay. I thought if you walk away, then everything's fine and life should just go back to normal. Um, and that's one of the things that gets missed when we're talking about these kind of experiences or when you see them on the news, the people with the mental and emotional wounds were invisible in most of these stories. Um, and that day, thanks to, well, thanks to, because of the experience, I started what I have now realized is, is, the thing that drives me, the why that drives me and my work, which is to ensure that trauma survivors are seen, heard, and supported in our communities and our organizations. And so, as you know, you know, in the moment of trauma, our bodies respond to the stress, right? They send a distress signal that activates our defense mechanisms. This happens to everybody. It's biology. It's what our bodies are supposed to be doing um, to keep us safe. And then when we get to a place where we are physically safe, then eventually our systems get back to regular functioning. You know, for some people that happens really quickly. In my case, my friend who was standing right next to me and one could argue saw and experienced exactly what I experienced about two weeks in. She literally just kind of brushed herself off and she was fine, legitimately fine. That is not my story. I went on to develop post-traumatic stress and have struggled with it for these past 11 years, although less and less and less so as we come closer to here in time. Because um, I got stuck in survival mode and that impaired my ability to function. Um, and... 
I know, I know you guys know so much of what I'm talking about, but it can take weeks or years to get back to regular functioning. And that is absolutely manual, right? It's unpleasant and it's not like to be the person it's happening to you, but these kind of feelings are normal. And anger is the one I want to talk about today. Um, it is a normal emotion and it is very common to feel anger after experiencing violence and trauma, especially violence that's caused by another person. And that anger takes all different shapes. Some people are angry at the perpetrator if there is one. Some people are angry at the situation. Some people just, it's kind of this generalized anger at the whole world. For me, that anger laser focused on the response by the city and the state and the lack of attention that they paid to those of us with the mental health wounds. Because I felt isolated and alone. I, early on, wasn't seeing my story, wasn't hearing people talk about the mental health side of things. So I thought, well, it's, it's my fault. It's me. I, I've been to therapy in the past, so this is a failing of me. And then when I started to learn that wasn't the case, I started to get really angry at, if it wasn't just me, that means it's other people. And there are probably hundreds of us feeling this way. And why aren't we being taken care of? So the key to dealing with anger in this case is to acknowledge it and try to process it in a healthy way. Because I think we've all had that experience of bottling up our anger or letting it really control us. And that can get in the way of healing and coming back to our regular functioning. So in my case, early on, the anger led to me isolating myself. I just had such a hard time um, dealing with it. I just pushed everybody away. And it can also lead in other people to destructive behaviors or substance abuse or self-harm. And if we get stuck in that anger, that can be a problem going forward. Now, people often refer to anger as a secondary emotion, that it's really covering up something else, often the fear or vulnerability and Somehow being angry can make it easier to deal with those feelings, or shall I say, we think it's easier to deal with those feelings. And in my case, I do think that the anger was covering up that vulnerability um, and fear, and the fear that I was not having a normal reaction. So in some ways, I will say I have been angry for the last 11 years. Um, in my case, that anger, I took that energy of the anger because it's telling me something. So I started to ask, what are you telling me? And I took that towards action. Now, at first, the um, my anger turned towards trying to make a change for those of us who experienced the bombing. So trying to work with the city to make something happen. Um, and so a few months after the bombing, I wrote some letters. I was feeling invisible. I was frustrated at the response that it didn't include mental health. Um, it was focused on the people with physical wounds and the bereaved families. And it didn't extend beyond that to those of us with mental distress. And I was under the impression that our leaders in the city just didn't, they just didn't know. I thought, okay, fine. They just don't know there's people like me out there. So I will educate them. I'm a writer. I am a proponent of the strongly worded letter. And so I wrote a bunch of letters to the governor, the mayor, my city councilors, my state senator, all these people. Now, I will be honest with you. It was a very long email. I had a lot of information to impart. Um, and But basically, the letter was, hey, I'm out here. A lot of people like me are out here. We're not getting the support we need. Can you help? Now, 
I'm about to show you a slide and I want to give you two pieces of information to know before you see this slide. So uh, there was a privately funded victim compensation fund to help the bereaved families and the people with physical injuries and that was called One Fund. And people like me, people with mental health or emotional wounds were specifically not allowed to participate. So that's um, number one. And then number two is, I am one of those people who believes you don't go to the boss with a problem if you don't also, also bring some form of solution. It doesn't have to be what you end up with, but at least don't just dump it all in their lap. Say, I have some ideas. So I actually didn't have any ideas, but what I said is I am 100% in, bring me in, let's sit down in a meeting, let's talk about what's going on with people like me and I will help you figure out a way. Now, to be clear, I, I'm not a therapist. I have no training in mental health. I am simply someone who felt like I'm experiencing this and maybe my lived experience can make a difference. So everybody replied to me in some way. The governor's office, his chief of staff called me. She was lovely. We had an amazing conversation. We had 15 or 20 minutes, she offered to help. Could she find services for me? All of the things that you would want in a situation like this. She was very compassionate. I. Other people were also compassionate. It was it was absolutely lovely. But I will say something, not a single one of those phone calls or emails or meetings that I had with anybody changed a thing about the response. But almost everybody treated me like a human being who was in pain. One person didn't. And I wanna show you this email that I received from the mayor's office, which I will read. You will have to contact one fund directly at phone number regarding victim assistance. Mayor Menino and Boston City Hall are not involved with this issue. Sincerely, Mayor's Correspondence Staff. I, I wrote to my mayor and said I'm traumatized and I need help. And this was the response. It was not even signed by a human. It was written by a human because I actually, uh, I, I ended up finding out who it was and talking to her, but it was, you know, I mean, honestly, if I wrote this letter to somebody, I wouldn't put my name on it either because this is just um, awful. So I gave up. For the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, I gave up thinking that the city was going to actually help us. This is this is clear. We have no compassion. We don't think you matter. You know, go away. So I turned that anger into working to change the system on a different level and to change how we talk about mental and emotional trauma. So my anger at all of it, but getting that letter, my anger drove me to action. And I became an advocate without really realizing it. Um, I started speaking on stages about paying attention to the mental and emotional side of tragedy. I spoke to first responders in public safety to say, hey, don't forget us when something like this happens. You know, we're struggling too. And, um, you know, helping people think about how do you Effectively communicate about this kind of trauma. And as part of that, but I called the office of my congresswoman, Ayanna Presley, and somehow, even though I didn't know exactly what I was asking her for, I knew she would help. And she did. A few months after the conversation with her team, um, I found out that they had submitted and introduced to the House of Representatives H.R. 5703, the Post-Disaster Mental Health Response Act. So they had identified a gap in federal support after disasters and emergencies. Um, it's called the Stafford Act. You've probably heard of it. It's what the governor or the mayor invokes when they say we're declaring a state of emergency because of these wildfires, or we're declaring a major disaster because of 9-11, for example. Um, and 
that declaration frees up federal support. And until December 2022, when this law was passed and signed into law by President Biden, the federal government would only provide support to major disasters. So like 9-11 or something that impacted, had a massive financial impact. But emergencies like wildfires or tornadoes or the Boston Marathon bombing, which was declared an emergency, were not eligible to get mental health support. Now they are. There's no there's no limitation. If somebody declares an emergency for a wildfire or a tornado, which seem to be the two things stuck in my head, um, they are eligible to get mental health support. So had this law been in place in 2013, maybe there would have been more support for people like me. So I've had success once I moved beyond talking to the city. But you know what? I'm still angry at the city. And I will tell you that uh, starting several years ago, I have stopped loving living in the city of Boston because I'm so angry that successive administrations have continued um, the, the theme that people like me don't matter. So last year, but 2023 was our 10 year anniversary. And so survivors like me, a bunch of us reached out to the city to say, we know you're planning something, some sort of commemoration. We would like to help be inclusive so that you're, you're addressing the needs of all the different kinds of survivors. I happen to also live in the neighborhood. So I also knew that people in the neighborhood felt very traumatized by this, but there was no attention whatsoever to them because, because there just wasn't. So we, we worked with them. Well, theoretically, we started working with the city to work on the 10 the year anniversary commemoration. And this is part of the email response, um, which is yes, we are working on it, but we're not incorporating outside community members, despite us multiple times explaining how we all were connected to this event, we still don't count in the city's eyes. So this is partly why I remain angry 11 years later that even talking to this individual and explaining the situation and explaining that we had been excluded, they still excluded us because they don't count us as real survivors. So I also talk a lot about the concept of resiliency and um, like me, you may have hated this word when you first heard it, because I remember thinking, who are these people? What's this resiliency that these other people magically have? Because I don't have any of it. I know now we all have some ability to bounce back. We all can recover from our difficulties. We all have different levels of resiliency. My friend who brushed herself off two weeks later just has a different level of resiliency than I do. Um, but anger can also be a powerful tool as we're working on our resiliency. Um, like in my case, it really lit the fire of, you know, seeking justice and wanting to make change. Um, and, you know, once I acknowledged my anger, tried to understand it, I haven't always understood it, then I'm kind of able to harness the power, right? To be an advocate, motivated me to speak out. I will tell you that I had zero fear of public speaking when I talk about this subject because it, I have been so angry and it is so important to me to make change that that blocks out the fact that I'm standing in front of 500 people. Um, and anger can also help us set boundaries for ourselves. Um, I can tell you that I got rid of several friend relationships after the bombing because they wouldn't respect my boundaries. And it, that anger kind of gave me the power to identify them and actually hold firm to what was important to me. And you know, for me, the, the facing that anger and working through it was really empowering, um, which is a surprise to me that I could turn that anger, you know, kind of into a strength. 
And there are ways to do that, right? We can, we can um, journal and write it down and, and release it in a healthy way. Um, physical activity is a huge one for me for getting rid of my anger. I'm often just walk out the door and go for a really long walk. And, and sometimes I'm practically running, although I don't run. Um, it, but I just have got all this energy I need to get out. Um, mindfulness has been a really important one for me as well, as has support groups and counseling as well. Um, you know, I will, I will tell you that I am in a really good place. I am. Last weekend or the Mo Friday Memorial Day weekend, some friends and I were on the waterfront in Boston, just hanging out, chatting. It was beautiful. There were a lot of people out, but we thought, ah. There's a lot of people out because it's a beautiful Friday evening. It's the start of summer and we're just sitting there and we're chatting and all of a sudden just boom. And I jumped back probably five or six feet. I don't even, I don't know if I jumped, I ran. I don't know what I did. My friends stuck with me and I know I scared the, the Jesus out of them. There was a fireworks show in the harbor. That's why it was crowded, not because it was a beautiful evening. And my friends asked me if I was okay. You know, they know me, they know my story. Do you need to go? Should we leave? What's happening? And I said, you know what? Let's stay. I, if I can see the fireworks, I'm, I'm going to be okay. And about halfway through the show, you know, the 10, 15 minute show, I realized, wow, I am okay. Like, this is not my favorite fireworks show ever. I'm really annoyed at how we discovered there was a fireworks show. But all of this work that I did, the mindfulness and the journaling and all this advocacy and channeling my anger into making change has helped me work through it. And I could actually, you know, recognize, okay, I know why I jumped back six feet because my brain was like, no, oh, hell no. We know what's happening. We can't deal with this. But then I was able to, you know, kind of calm myself down. And I was so amazed that by the time I got home, I almost forgot that we had been there and that I had been startled by the fireworks show. So I don't know, from where I sit, anger, when we acknowledge it and we process it, I think it can be a really powerful ally in, um, you know, in healing. And I think the one thing that I learned that was really important over these last 11 years is that our emotions have a message for us. So I'm now able to stop and listen what do I think the message is from this particular emotion? And, you know, thanks to my anger, this is where I am in life. I ask myself this question almost every day, and I now have a whole new way of earning a living, and it's resolved, it revolves around this. You know, how can we support trauma survivors and inspire resilience, empathy, and well being in our communities and organizations? And this is the lens I see the world through. I think we can make real change. I'm not sure I've seen a ton of change in these last 11 years, but we are moving slowly. And, you know, as someone who has been told to my face that my experience doesn't count, I, I was told I have no right to be upset because I still have both of my legs. So after those kind of experiences, I want to change the world. I want to make it so that people don't hear those kinds of things after something horrible happens to them. The way that I felt isolated and like it was my fault after one of the worst days of my life. And so like a lot of you here, I've faced moments that have made me feel that just profound anger. And it is a powerful emotion and it can be really scary and it can be a force for good when when we're able to harness it and channel it. Um, so, you know, we just touched lightly on sort of ways we could manage our anger and how that connects to resilience. And 
So just remember that it's not about ignoring the emotion. It's not about ignoring the anger. It's learning to deal with it. So, you know, I hope my story is empowering for you. And, and if anger is something that you've been dealing with, that you can find a way to for it to be a force for good or for positive change. And you can listen to what it's saying in your life. So thank you very much. We thought this would be an appropriate po poem given um, the conversation tonight. Um, it's the author's John Rodell. I found this probably six years ago and I actually printed it and put it on my refrigerator just to remind me that I wasn't falling apart. All these changes that I was going through during my healing journey was was making me who I was really supposed to be. Um, so I've, I've shared this with a lot of survivors and it's really resonated. So we wanted to share it with you guys tonight. Um, so it's me. Hey, God. God. Hello. Me. I'm falling apart. Can you put me back together? God. I would rather not. Me. Why? God. Because you aren't a puzzle. Me, what about all the pieces of my life that are falling down onto the ground? God, let them stay there for a while. They fell off for a reason. Take some time and decide if you need any of those pieces back. Me, you don't understand. I'm breaking down. God, no, you don't understand. You are breaking through. What you are feeling are just growing pains. You are shedding the things and the people in your life that are holding you back. You are falling apart. You are falling into place. Relax. Take some deep breaths and allow those things you don't need anymore to fall off of you. Quit holding on to the pieces that don't fit you anymore. Let them fall off. Let them go. Me. Once I start doing that, what will be left of me? God. Only the very best pieces of you. Me. I'm scared of changing. God. I keep telling you, you aren't changing. You are becoming me becoming who god be who coming who i created you to be a person of light and love and charity and hope and courage and joy and mercy and grace and compassion i made you for more than the shallow pieces that you've decided to adorn yourself with that you cling to with such greed and fear let those things fall off you i love you don't change become 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 who i made you to be I'm going to keep telling you this until you remember it. Me, there goes another piece. God, yep, let it be. Me, so I'm not broken? God, of course not, but you are breaking like the dawn. It's a new day, become. And what I found out recently, um, John Rodell has turned to po poetry to help with his his challenges that he's had with mental health. Um, so he's definitely, he's, he writes some really interesting ones that, that, resonated that have resonated with me and you know like manya said she turned that anger into being an advocate um and that was her that was what she was becoming that was what she was meant to do so just wanted to remind you guys um about the integrative program or integrative services programs offered through the resiliency center they're available to anyone impacted by any mass violence incident. This includes uh, heart peer support, meditation and mindfulness, trauma recovery yoga, art therapy, and equine, equine demonstrations. You can find more information and register on the Resiliency and Justice Center's website on the calendar. And this is, um, anything in yellow on here is things that we're all eligible to attend. There is a trauma recovery yoga it's via Zoom um, this Saturday at 10 a.m. PT. If excuse me, if anybody is interested, I highly recommend it. It's it's definitely yoga for anybody. It's nothing strenuous, um, and you can turn your camera off so you don't even have to to show yourself on it as you're going through the the stretches that she gives you. But it, it, it's a great program, um, and I've also really enjoyed the art therapy. So those are those are two of mine that I've been focusing on lately. If you need, if you'd like additional support, um, we can always pair you with a heart peer mentor uh, that's on the Resiliency Center's website forward slash heart. 
Um, you can also, the Disaster Distress Helpline, and we have Michael joining us from the Disaster Distress Helpline. He is one of the peers on their Surviv uh, Survivors of Mass Violence Facebook page. That is monitored 24-7 by crisis counselors, and it's monitored a good part of the day by trained peers as well. And they, they have been impacted one way or another by mass violence. Um, the National Mass Violence Center is also a great, great place for resources. And then um, if ever necessary, there's the, the 988 suicide and, and crisis lifeline. So next month, we're super excited to bring in Dr. Alexis Kennedy talking to us on trauma, stress, and sleep. We've actually had Dr. Kennedy talk with our mentors during the training several times, and I learned at least three or four things new every single time she presents for us. And I've, I've heard her speak probably four times, I was four or five. Yeah. So it, it's definitely one. Um, I know firsthand that going through what I went through has really messed with my sleep cycle. And I still almost seven years later, still have some, some from time to time, still have some problems. So it, it's definitely going to be a helpful presentation. We just really appreciate you guys for joining us. Um, as we mentioned earlier on, we will have the recording posted. You know, if you have other friends, family members who've been impacted by mass violence, you know, please definitely share this with them. Um, while we don't record the discussion, the, the presentation is super, super helpful. If you guys have any any questions, any topic su suggestions, anything like that, please feel free to, to email Jackie, Alice, and me at harpier91 at gmail.com. And if you're not a part of our Facebook group page, um, we do have a First Tuesdays with Heart Facebook page that we'd encourage you guys to join. And if you want to you know, post motivational things, things like that, that just that resonate with you, they resonate with you, they're going to resonate with others. So you guys have a wonderful night and hope to see you next month.